going to talk about 1 Corinthians chapter 13 today. It's the last Sunday in the month of love. I guess February gets that because of Valentine's Day, so I thought very appropriate to end uh, February. I can't believe we're at the end of February, but to end February on a message exploring this passage <clears throat> and grabbing from it what God wants us to grab. Now, as you're turning there, I want each of you to think about this phrase or this question, love is, dot, 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 love is. And uh, don't do it out loud, but I want you to fill that in, right? Or maybe even during the service, begin filling that blank is. Now, in. Now, not only is 1 Corinthians 13 probably the greatest passage on the subject matter of love, but it is probably also uh, the greatest passage ever written by the one who wrote the most under the inspiration of God in the New Testament, and that is the Apostle Paul. Why is this probably his greatest passage? Well, I believe because it gives the most accurate answer to what God says love is. God actually answers the question, love is, or what is love, right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And in just a moment, we're going to dig into this passage. We're going to examine it. We're going to hopefully pull out of it or the Holy Spirit show us what the Lord wants us to get out of it this morning. But I do ask that you go to the Lord in prayer with me. Father... We love you and thank you for loving us. Uh, God, thank you for this passage that we're going to be looking at today in which there is no doubt your description of what love is. Father, I pray for two groups of people here this morning. Number one, your children. Those of us who have said yes to Jesus Christ. Those of us who have said yes to that gift of grace by faith in what Christ did for us when he came down here to this earth. I pray that you'd help each of your children here today to be willing and ready to receive something from you. Yes, we've been worshiping you in song, but Lord, now it's time to worship you by taking what you give us from your word and then doing what you want for us to do with it. Lord, I pray that you would help your children to be open and Lord, to be willing uh, to hear from you today because you're here. Each one of us here is here by divine appointment. You have a work that you want done in each of our hearts. And Father, I also pray for the group represented here. No matter how small that group may be, even if it's only one person who has never said yes to you, never said yes to that gift of grace, never experienced the ultimate form of your love in the gift of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help them to realize some things today. Number one, that you love them. Uh, Number two, that you are here, the Holy Spirit is here to have yet again another encounter with them, offering that gift of grace. But Father, may they also grab a hold of the fact that no one, no one has promised their next breath. And Father, as we still are uh, sorrowing, Father, with those families down in Florida, Father, I would say this, that none of those 17 young people who went to school that day, none of them knew that they were going to enter eternity. And yet they did. Father, I pray that if there is one here today who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, that they would realize that today, today could be the last time that they hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that today they would say yes to the only decision that can change their eternal destination. Above all else, Father, we pray that you'll be glorified today. That the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Thank you for allowing me to be a small part of your work. In Jesus' precious name. And all of God's people said? All right. First, it's important that you know who Paul is speaking to here. Actually, it's important for you to know who God is speaking to here. Obviously, you know that every word of the word of God was written by men, but inspired by God. And so, though in context, Paul is speaking to the first century church of Corinth. Right, That's where you see 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. These are letters, epistles that the Apostle Paul was writing to a church that he founded uh, in Corinth as a first century city. But through the eternality of God's word and the fact that God never changes, God is speaking to us some 2,000 years later. God is speaking to all Christians in all of the centuries since. And so you need to know that this is not just a letter to a church uh, that we can learn historically from. This is God's word, and so God is speaking to us today. Lighthouse Baptist Church in Vincent, Ohio, in the 21st century, God wants you to know what love is. We're going to look at five parts. Number one, it's real simple, real simple, Christians, real simple, believers, real simple, church. Are you ready? Love, God's love, agape love is a command. 
It's a command. So make sure you understand something. To love like God loved is not an option. Now, you do have a choice. We are the crowning achievement of God's creation. We're the only part of his creation that he gave us a choice to obey him or not. But please, don't mistake that for the fact that love is an option. Love's not an option. You have to make the choice to love, but love is a command. Don't take my word for it. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40, Jesus is addressing a, tr- a question from some of the religious leaders who were probably trying to trap him once again. They said, oh, Jesus, tell us. Lord, Master, Rabbi, tell us what the greatest commandment is. And Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he goes on to say all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And what Jesus was saying is look, all that's going to be given to you from God's word can be summed up. Can be summed up in these two statements. Love God and love people. If you are accurately and biblically and Christ-like loving God and loving people, you can be certain that you are striving to live out the word of God. That is what God and his word is all about. So then the question becomes, individual Christians, the question becomes many members of one body at Lighthouse Baptist Church or wherever you go to church, are we as individual Christians, are we as churches, bodies of believers, loving God and loving people? Are we? Are you? Am I? Now before we answer the question quickly, maybe we better wait a little bit until we dive into more of this passage and find out really what that means. Really what love is. Love is a command. Love is a command. Now here's the great part about knowing a command from God. God is never going to tell you to do something that he doesn't equip you to do. God is never going to tell you to do something that he doesn't give you the equipment that you need to do. The word of God makes that clear. Remember last week? God tells us at times to fear not. God tells us at times that we're going to have to deal with tragedy and he equips us to do it. We talked about that last week. But it's the same thing in loving like him. He will equip us. He will tell us and show us how to do it. Here's what we have to do. We have to claim. We have to claim his strength. We have to claim his grace. We have to claim his instruction. We have to claim his power. We have to claim his presence. We have to do that. And because he will never leave us powerless, because he will never leave us uh, looking for enablement to do what he's told us to do, because love is a command, here we go, love is possible now you're saying rob the way you said love is possible you make it sound like love agape love god's love is kind of hard to do you make it sound like it's almost impossible for us to do and i would say this it is god's love loving god and loving people the way god wants us to love is hard is tough in fact It is impossible. Now, please know I'm not talking about the world's definition of love. Please know I'm not talking about society's definition of love. Please know I'm not talking about Hollywood's definition of love. All of those definitions of love, those methods of love, they are easy. You want to know why they're easy? Because they're based on self. It's all about take and no give. But as you're going to see in a few moments, the love of God, the love that God demands, agape love, is nothing but give. There is no take in agape love. There is no take in God's love. It's all about sacrifice. It's all about denying self. Jesus Christ said in Luke 9, 23, those that want to follow me, you got to deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow me. And so therefore... For self-filled, self-absorbed sinners that we all are naturally, it is impossible. But praise God, what's impossible with men is absolutely possible with God. All things are possible with Him. And so we can rejoice in the fact that it is a command and it is possible for one reason. Philippians 4.13, I, and that's a qualified I, He's talking to his children, people that have said yes to Jesus. I, you, can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And that all 
includes the impossible act of loving God and loving people as God loves them. You understand that, right? You can do anything because Christ is in you. He is with you. It is not impossible. So how does he give me strength? How does he give me guidance? How do I do this impossible task? Well, continue rejoicing in the fact that because he is in you. He's in you. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. You're still living. God did not take us to heaven as soon as we got saved. God has a mission for us to accomplish, a general mission furthering his kingdom, a specific mission that he has for you in doing that with your sphere of influence, school, church, work, hobbies. You're to be glorifying God by furthering his kingdom. So the life that you now live in the flesh, that you should be living for him, how are you living that? You live by faith in the Son of God, who loved you and gave himself for you. The ultimate gift. Now, I don't know when you accepted that gift. I do know when I did. It doesn't matter when. What matters is that I did accept that gift of grace that came from God in the form of Jesus Christ. Dying on the cross, shedding his blood, having lived a perfect life, paying for my sins, making sure that I could be forgiven, reconciled relationship with God so that one day I could spend all eternity with him, not having to be separated from him, which is what happens if you enter eternity without accepting that gift of grace. That's what happens to spend eternity away from him in that place called hell. I don't know when you accepted that, but if you did... And when I did, the moment it happened, the second it happened, the millisecond it happened, you want to know who came inside of you? The Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit. You have been indwelt by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God has a job. Number one, he's kind of your down payment, your engagement ring, so that one day when you get to heaven, that's how, you, that's how they know the Holy Spirit is in you. Okay, But while you're here on earth... To guide you, to direct you, to lead you, to illuminate God's word so that you have a better understanding and to help you. In fact, Galatians chapter 5 makes it clear what the Spirit is supposed to do and what we're supposed to do. The Spirit's supposed to lead and we're supposed to... The Spirit's supposed to lead and we're supposed to follow. The Spirit's supposed to lead and we're supposed to walk behind. And if that is happening, then the Bible makes it clear what will happen... We will bear fruit. And guess what the very first fruit of the Spirit is? Love. Love. Agape love. God's love. By the power of God. Through the gift of God in His Son. Using the indwelling of the God, the Holy Spirit. All things are possible. Even... Loving God and loving others with God's type of love. Well, so far, we've covered two of our five points. Love is a command and love is possible. And we've yet to even look at one word of our text. Well, that stops now. Look with me at verses 1 through 3. This morning I'm reading out of the New American Standard Bible, verses 1 through 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and again that I, Paul is speaking, but he's referencing that I as all Christians. If we as Christians, as we as believers, if we can speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as if to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Now let me put these three verses and the entire passage in context. Why is Paul saying what he was saying when he said it? It's important that you know this. It's very important. Paul is addressing spiritual gifts. You can look at some key words in the passage we just read and you'll see it. Tongues, prophecy, faith, 
and giving. These are all part of the spiritual gifts. You understand spiritual gifts, right? They come from God. Anybody who is a believer, anybody who is saved, per the Bible, you have at least, at least one spiritual gift. Now, why is Paul addressing this? And why does this take us into the chapter about love? Well, in chapter 12, Paul is kind of having to rebuke them. He's having to give them instruction because they are improperly using their spiritual gifts. In fact, some of them aren't using the spiritual gifts because they're too busy fussing and arguing and fighting about which one of the gifts is the greatest, which one is more important. And what Paul is saying As he moves into chapter 13 is this. Listen up, folks. It doesn't matter what your spiritual gift is. It doesn't matter if yours is better or worse, greater or not. If you don't have the proper driving force behind the spiritual gift and the use of the spiritual gift, and that proper driving force is L-O-V-E, God's agape love, then it matters not. It profits you absolutely nothing. Nothing. Your use of the gift, even if you're using it, is worthless if not driven by God. And so that brings us to the third part of our answer. Not only is love a command, not only is love possible, but because of what we know was going on in chapter 12 and what Paul has said in the first three verses of chapter 13, love is essential. True God-like love, agape love, is essential for the work of the Lord. Period. I believe at times, we as individual Christians and we as a church, we forget this. We get caught up in our gifts. We get caught up in the use of our gifts. We get caught up in our ministry. We get caught up in our programs. We get caught up in our tradition. We get caught up in us. That we forget, number one, who we're serving. We forget then also what should be the driving force behind all that we do. And that is a love for God because of how much he loved us. At times, though, there are those believers who at times not only choose maybe to use their gift in the wrong way as if not driven by that motive of love, but then there are many believers who just choose not to use their gifts. Let me make it clear because the Bible makes it clear that all of us are given at least one spiritual gift and we are not given that gift to sit around looking at it and polishing it and just admiring it or just throwing it away. We're given that gift to use. And if you're not using it, You are just as guilty as those who are using it, but are using it with the wrong motive. Now hear me, whether it's because we're not using the gifts, or maybe it's because we're using the gifts, but we're wrapped up in other stuff and not being motivated by the love of God. If that is the case, we may be doing a work, a work, but we're not doing his work. We're serving somebody, but we're not serving our Savior. And Paul makes it clear, if this is the case, Lighthouse Baptist Church, if this is the case, you many members who make up this one body, then what you are doing is worth nothing. What you are doing has no profit. Period. We must know that loving like God loves is possible. We can obey that command. It is essential for the work that we're supposed to be about. All of us, individually and as a body. But we also have to know that if we are pursuing those uses of gifts with the proper mode of love, listen to me, there will be evidence. So there we are. Love is evidenced. Love is evidenced. Love is not just a feeling. It's not some warm, gooey feeling. It's not just a word that in today's society and culture, especially in the United States of America, has just been overused and thrown around too much, carelessly and without thought. Listen, love is a verb. In fact, let's get more specific For you English teachers out there, love is an action verb. And for it to be an action verb, there must be... Let's try that again. 
You've heard the three people that got it right, so now you know the answer. It's action. If love is an action verb, then there must be action. Absolutely. What is that action? What is that evidence? You're right? You walk outside and I claim to have an apple tree. What better be hanging from the limbs of that tree? Very good. Apples. What should be hanging? What should be the fruit? What should be the evidence? You know what? It's almost like God is all-knowing. He is, by the way. Uh, you would almost think that God would know that we were going to ask that question, that we were going to wonder, okay, so what should be the evidence? And so what does he do in his love for us? He lets us know what love is. He lets us know what love does. He lets us know the practices of love. And we're going to take a look at each. Now, if you've done some counting while you've been sitting there, you know that there's 14. You've probably looked at your watch and saw that it's 11 o'clock. You're probably thinking, even if he spends two minutes on each one, we're looking at 28 more minutes. I know how you think. So let me put you at rest. I'm not going to preach an individual sermon on each one of these. We're going to kind of take a bird's eye view, a reader's digest view of these, but they are very important. You need to know that. But here's what you also need to know. As we look at all of them, please know what the benchmark is. Please know who the ultimate example is, and it is God, right? 1 John 4, 7, and 8 makes it clear, declares that not only is God the source of agape, which is love, but God is agape. God is Love, And if you want to see how that plays out, get in the Gospels and read the life, read about the life of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is the image of the Father. One more thing, one more thing I want to ask you as we begin. I've already asked you to kind of fill in what that definition is of love is. But as we go through each of these 14, when we get to the end of each one, I'm going to ask a question or I'm going to make a statement. Love is, and I'll be speaking to me, and you can speak to yourself, love is me, yes or no. As we go through what love should be, how we should be loving God and loving people, ask yourself and allow the Holy Spirit to answer, love is me, yes or no. Number one, love is patient. We see this in verse 4. Love is patient. Love practices patience. Love is long-suffering. Now, the Greek word here is makrothumio. And I want you to know that, not so you can speak Greek or think that you're smart. I want you to know that because we've got to look at the original language, the word picture. What was God trying to say? Well, through the word makrothumio, which has a word picture, literally means long-tempered. Now, we should be long-tempered in circumstances, but really this verse is speaking to how we deal with other people. We should be long-tempered tempered with other people it means that we should have the ability remember this is impossible with us but only possible through god through god we have the ability to be inconvenienced through god we have the ability to be taken advantage of by a person over and over again and through god we have the ability to withstand that and not get angry not get upset true love is patient and never seeks vengeance it never retaliates it's patient Love is patient. Love is me. Yes or no. Number two, love is kind. Love does, there's the verb, love does kind things. I love how one person put it when he said this, just as patience will take anything from others, kindness will give anything to others, even to its enemies. Ephesians 4.32 makes it absolutely clear. The first three words, be ye kind. Be ye kind. It goes on then to talk to us about being tender-hearted. It means be well, have welfare for other people. It comes from a Greek word which means to be useful. It means to be serving. It means to be gracious. You look in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 40 and 41, you'll see the instructions of kindness are played out in that we should go the extra mile for people. And you want to know why we're doing it? We should have a smile on our face, yes. But that visible smile on our face better be matched by the visible smile in our heart. Because if it's just on our face and not on our heart, though everybody else may think we're doing it for the right reason, God knows 
Love is kind. True love, God's love is kind. Love is me, yes or no. Love is not jealous. The word there is zilu. In the word picture there, it means to have a strong desire for. Love does not have a strong desire for what someone else has, nor does it strongly desire that the person who didn't get it, didn't get it. If you're truly loving people like God loved people, you don't mind looking at someone who's gotten more possessions, maybe they're more popular, maybe they've got a better position, ability, beauty, or anything else that God has blessed them with. You don't look at them going, dang, on it, why do they get so much? How can Barry Smith be so good looking and me be so ugly? How is that possible? I looked, Barry was smiling at me, that's why I called him out. We look at other people, even those that are better looking than us, and we say, you know what? I'm happy that you are blessed. True love refuses to be jealous. Jealousy is a very powerful thing. You know how I know that? Because the sin came from Satan. You want to know what got Satan kicked out of heaven? He wanted to be God. He was jealous of the power God had, the glory God got. He wanted to be God. He became jealous through his pride. And we see it led to his destruction. Do you understand that Satan wants to destroy us? He wants to devour us. And Christians, listen to me. He can't have your soul. But if through jealousy he can have your service and your effectiveness, he'll use it. Relationships have been destroyed through jealousy. Churches have been devoured through jealousy. Let us not be jealous. True love refuses it. Real love is me, yes or no. Love does not brag. And we're kind of taking jealousy to another level. The Greek word kind of has this word picture. Bragging is the other side of jealousy. Jealousy is wanting what someone else has. Bragging is trying to make others jealous with what we have. And it ties right in to the next in verse 4. Love does not only not brag, love is not arrogant. The Greek word is phuseo. It gives the word picture of being puffed up. Love is not puffed up. Love is not self-inflated. Love is not proud. Love does not have a high opinion of itself. You want to know why? Because God's love knows the truth in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Love is not proud. Love does not beg or love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. Agape love is me, is you, yes or no. As we shift into verse 5, we're told love does not act unbecomingly. Uh, the Greek word is askamon, and it means love is not rude. There's the picture. It's not insensitive to people's feelings. It's not careless. It's tactful. It's polite. It's thoughtful. It's caring. Can I tell you something? Even when we're disagreeing with someone, and even when we're trying to share God's word with a non-believer, and they just don't believe it, even if you're dealing with an atheist or whoever, and they throw it back in your face, it's not being rude with them. Not everybody agreed with Jesus. They hung him on a cross. And yet, was he ever rude with any of them? The answer is no. No. So even in a disagreement, we can still not act unbecomingly. Why? Because we're supposed to be loving like God. Are we? Yes or no. Love does not seek its own. That means love doesn't worship itself. Love doesn't have the attitude, okay, it didn't go my way, so I'm going to take my ball and go home. Can I say that happens all the time in churches around the nation? You're not singing the songs I want you to sing. I'm out. You're not worshiping the way I want to worship. I'm out. This service is not going the way I thought it should go. I'm out. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Now, please know, I'm not talking about a service that compromises the word of God. Period. I'm not. But just because a style of worship may be a little bit different, just because it may not go exactly the way you want it to go, you want to know what true love does? It doesn't seek its own. We should have our focus on the kingdom of God and furthering that kingdom and wanting to see people come in, lost people come in, feel at home, feel welcome, not feel like they're in a place where they're being stared down. Love doesn't seek its own. It seeks the well-being of others. It seeks that what the Heavenly Father wants. Love is truly me, yes or no. Love is not provoked. 
The Greek word there, it means it's not easily angered. It's not easily stirred up. When somebody says something about you, when somebody says something against you, when somebody says something that offends you personally, in our human nature, we want to bow up. We want to get bad. We just want to throw down, right? But with the love of God, we're not easily angered. We're not easily upset. I really laughed when I read this quote and then the response. This person said, yeah, I lose my temper. In fact, I lose it quite a bit, but there's no real damage. I blow up. And a few minutes later, it's over. The person they were speaking to said, you know what's kind of funny? That's how a nuclear bomb reacts. It blows up, and then it's over. But what is left? Tremendous amounts of damage. Let's not be like that. Let's not be easily provoked. Love is me. Love is not provoked, yes or no. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. What does that mean? Love is forgiving. The ultimate example, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, that was Jesus Christ. He's the ultimate example. But let's look at even someone like us, more like us, a human being. A sinful, fallen human being. You look at Stephen, the first martyr. He was stoned to death. And while he was being stoned, you want to know what he said to them? While he was being stoned, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let us have the attitude of Stephen, who was being Christ-like there. Let us do that. Let us not uh, let us let us be kind one to another, forgiving one another. I love how one person said it. Love does not forgive and forget, but rather remembers and still forgives. Let me say that one more time. Love does not forgive and forget, which is almost impossible, but rather remembers and still forgives. Well, verse number six begins with love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, period. I read of a pastor who said it like this. Love never takes satisfaction from sin. Whether our own or others, love never justifies sin. It never tries to make wrong appear right. It will not compromise. Folks, one of the biggest problems in the church, especially in America today, is sin is not dealt with correctly. I'm just being real with you. You want to know why the passage about church discipline was put into the Bible? Because we are supposed to correctly deal with sin. Now, as soon as you hear me say the word church discipline, you kind of get this like bristles on the back of your neck because you think church discipline has to be hateful, has to be angry, has to be unloving. Well, that may be the way it looks today, but that's not the way it's supposed to be. You understand the purpose of dealing with sin, whether it's one-on-one or Two on whatever it is, according to the the book of Matthew, according to what the Bible says church discipline is supposed to be, you understand it's supposed to be for the glory of God and the restoration of a relationship and the furthering of the kingdom through the re-solidifying of the church. It's all about love. So even if we were to dive into church discipline, it still has to be motivated by agape love. It's not me wanting to be right because you're wrong or you wanting to be right because I'm wrong. It's me wanting to go to a brother or, or a female wanting to go to a sister and saying, look, I love you. Because I love you and because I love God, I want what's best for you. And here's what I see, and it's not best for you. But even in church discipline, as we're dealing with a wrong suffered, we are being loving. Even We're never, though, rejoicing in unrighteousness. We cannot compromise in our love. It's not love to compromise. Love rejoices with the truth, and that's why we can't rejoice in compromise. You cannot rejoice in the truth of God. You can't rejoice in the word of God if you're at the same time rejoicing in unrighteousness, putting up with sin. It means rejoicing in the word of God, rejoicing in the Bible, rejoicing in the teachings of God, rejoicing in the doctrines of God. Nothing more, nothing less. We rejoice when the word of God encourages us. We rejoice when the word of God supports us. We rejoice when the word of God defends us. We rejoice when the word of God comforts us. But we also rejoice as we walk out of Sunday if the word of God has stepped on our toes. If the word of God has rebuked us. If the word of God has corrected us. Notice I didn't say the pastor. It's not my job to do that. It is my job to share with you the word of God. It's the word of God and the Holy Spirit's job to convict you or rebuke you or step on your toes. I'm just the messenger. And the greatest saying in all the world is don't shoot the messenger. Because I got to tell you, 
Because I rejoice in God's word too. Normally, before he steps on your toes with his word, he has stepped all over mine. Let us rejoice in the truth. Now, as we move into verse 7, Paul uses four extreme exaggerations. Paul uses four hyperboles. And as we go into these, I want you to make sure that you understand, for example, when he says love bears all things, love believes all things, love hopes all things, love endures all things. All, the word all there, has to be wrapped in the parameters of God's word. It has to be wrapped in the fact that God's not going to tell you not to rejoice in unrighteousness and at the same time tell you that love bears all things, to put up with unrighteousness. To, to be satisfied with it, to say it's okay. So make sure that these hyperboles, these extreme exaggerations, are still wrapped in the parameters of doing God's will and never sinning. Paul says love bears all things. It means love protects even when it has to rebuke. Love believes all things. It means innocent until proven guilty. And even if someone is guilty, we go about it with an attitude that is giving them the benefit of the doubt that they desire to make it right. Love hopes all things. It means no matter what the situation, your unsaved spouse, rebellious, prodigal child, terminally ill loved one, when faith is thin, hope hangs in. And finally, love endures all things. It really can be said no simpler than as one beloved Christian expressed. Are you ready? Love never stops loving. Agape, which is God's love, never stops loving. So Christian, church, how'd you do? We've gone through all 14. Now having seen from the word of God how the love of God that we are commanded to love with is defined, is practiced. Love is us, yes or no. Now, if you're like me, as I was preparing this message, and again, my toes were getting stepped on, if I was looking at a scale of perfection... I would have to say no to each of these. But praise God, right? We're not perfect yet. Praise God that though the Heavenly Father sees us as perfect, in practicality we are still striving to become that. And we'll be striving that on our walk of sanctification until one day we stand before Jesus Christ and we will see Him and we will be just like Him. That's when we'll be perfect. That's when we'll be done. So what am I trying to say? Well, I'm giving you the hope of knowing this. You're to be striving for perfection. And as long as the direction of your life is striving for that perfection. Yes, it matters if you mess up. But don't get all caught up when you mess up. Get up when you mess up. Confess when you mess up. Don't wallow around in condemnation because those sins have already been forgiven. The penalty's already been paid for. If you're not kind today... Get up, confess to the person you're not kind to, confess to God, make it right and move on. Keep on keeping on until one day when the battle's over, until one day when we are just as God sees us, we are actually perfect. We are going to mess up. It's not a question of perfection. It's a question of direction. So when it comes to true love, God's love, are you moving in the right direction? Well, this brings us to the fifth and final part of the answer. We've seen that love is a command. Because of that, we know love is possible. We know love is essential. We know that true love must be evidenced by action. And so number five falls into two parts. The first is seen in the first few phrases of verse 13. And the second in verse 8. Number one, love is the greatest. Love is the greatest. Let me share with you what I mean by that. But now abides faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is... Love. The greatest is love. 
Love is the greatest. Love is the ultimate. So what the answer that, to the question we're all wondering why? Well, that's part number two because love is eternal. Love is eternal. So let me show you in verse 8. It says, love never fails. Now you might say, now Pastor Rob, that doesn't say love is eternal. Well, no, in the English it doesn't. But you've got to look at the word fails in the original language. In the Greek, it comes from the Greek word pipto. Let me read for you what the meaning is. It's the idea of a final falling. And was used of a flower or a leaf that falls to the ground, withers and decays. But the word never in verse 8... So never, Pipto, refers to time, not to frequency. And the idea is at no time will divine love, at no time will God's love ever fall, at no time will God's love ever wither, at no time will God's love ever decay. By its very nature, God's love is permanent. It is eternal. It can never be abolished. Period. Folks, One day, whether it's through the rapture or through us breathing our last breath, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to begin your eternal existence with Jesus Christ. This is what verse 10 means when it says, when the perfect comes. So when this happens, then the remaining promises in that verse will come to to pass. It says, the partial will be done away. You want to know what this means? Prophecy will no longer be needed, for it will have been fully fulfilled. The spiritual gifts will no longer be needed because they will have fulfilled their purpose in his body down here. Knowledge, it will be made complete. We'll no longer think as children. And our mirrors, as the Bible says, will no longer be dim but crystal clear. Our faith, why won't we need faith anymore? Because our faith will have become what? Sight. Sight. We won't have to believe by faith. We'll believe by sight. And hope. Praise God when I'm with Jesus. Billy Graham. Praise God who is with Jesus today. Guess what his hope has become? Reality. Reality. But listen. Love will remain. Love cannot cease to exist. Because it is a part of the very nature of God. It is is God and as one man put it with me take a deep breath take it when you get to heaven this man says the very air of heaven will be God's love think about how beautiful 